Good morning. Welcome to the California Privacy Protection Agency Board's November 15th, 2021 meeting. My name is Jennifer Urban, and I am the chairperson of the board. Before we get started with the substance of the meeting, as usual, I have some logistical announcements. Uh, first, as a reminder, I'd like to ask everyone to please check that your microphone is muted when you're not speaking. Today's meeting will be run according to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, as required by law. Additionally, um, uh, this meeting is being recorded. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and for discussion by board members. We also have um, a designated time on the agenda for general public comment, um, as well as I will ask for public comment on each agenda item. Please note that each speaker will be limited to three minutes of speaking time per agenda item. Members of the public who wish to comment on any item may do so when prompted. If you're connected through the internet, please take a moment to locate the raise hand icon on your screen. This will be used to signal that you wish to comment. I regret that you, do mu you must be on a mobile device or a computer to participate in public comment because the BlueJeans platform doesn't allow for phone in attendees to participate at this time. Once you have requested a comment by pressing the raise hand icon, you'll be accepted and will be prompted to click continue. You must click continue to complete the process. You will then be unmuted and prompted to speak and you'll have up to three minutes to make your comment. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. It is helpful if you identify yourself, but this is entirely voluntary and you can input a pseudonym when you log into the meeting. I'd like to remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comments to three minutes. Relatedly, um, I'd like to remind everyone of the rules of the road under Bagley Keene. Both board members and members of the public may discuss items on the agenda only. Items not on the agenda can be suggested for discussion at future meetings when the board takes up the agenda item designated for that purpose. I think it's number nine today. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is our intent to ask for public comment prior to the board meeting on, excuse me, to the board voting on an agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you do wish to speak on that item, please use the raise your hand function so our moderator can recognize you. For those joining um, later, oh, excuse me, um, uh, um, we will take a break as needed. Um, if we need to go through lunch, we'll consider taking a break for lunch, um, uh, just depending where we are in the agenda and, and any short breaks as needed. I'd like to thank all the board members for their service and to all the people who are working to make the meeting possible. Thank you to Mr. Brian Souble, who is our interim general counsel, and Ms. Deborah Castanon, our interim chief deputy director of administration, who is assisting with moderation today. I'd like to thank the team from the Office of the Attorney General supporting us today, uh, Mr. Thomas Bruder, who's acting as our meeting counsel, Ms. Trini Hurtado, who's acting as moderator, and um, she's the conference services expert who's organized this meeting and the meeting infrastructure. Ms. Susan Wayland and Ms. Rachel Frazier are taking minutes, and thanks also to Ms. Stacey Heinsen for organizing all of the administrative staffing and resources. I'd also like to thank the team of the Department of Consumer Affairs for managing our communications list and our website where all the materials and the agenda are, and the staff at the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, um, uh, the Department of General Services, and other agencies who have continued to loan time behind the scenes, especially Deputy Secretary Leila Mirashidi, Deputy Secretary Tiffany Garcia, and Deputy General Counsel Philip Laird. I now call the meeting to order. And I'd like to ask our moderator, Ms. Hurtado, to please conduct the roll call. <clears throat> Good morning, and mm -hmm. thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Trini, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take roll to establish a quorum. Um, Ms. Lydia Delatore? Present. Mr. Vincent Lay? Present. Ms. Angela Sierra? Present. Mr. Christopher Thompson? Present. Ms. Jennifer Urban? Present. All board members are present. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hurtado. Uh, the board has established a quorum. 
I would like to let all the board members know that as is our usual practice, we will take a roll call vote on any action items today. And with that, let's move straight into the substantive part of our agenda, agenda item number two, which is an update from our new executive director, Ashkan Sultani. I will turn it over to Mr. Sultani now um, and come back when it's time for discussion. Mr. Sultani. Thank you, Chairperson Urban. I want to provide the board with a quick update, as you said. Um, since starting in October, my focus has been to get up to speed with regards to the agency's current operations. This includes familiarizing myself with the partner and control agencies we rely on, as well as identifying what policies and procedures are necessary. To start, I want to echo uh, your earlier remarks and express my gratitude for all the support that our support agencies have provided us, as well as agency BCSH. Um, uh, as you know, uh, the chair also reported that we'd expanded our arrangement with the AG's office in the last board meeting. I want to thank them for their legal support as well as operational support, for example, in this meeting. Um, quick, quick updates. So the current status, we currently have one full-time person, me, and one part-time uh, person, uh, uh, Richard Nguyen and Brian Sable, who's acting as our interim uh, general counsel. Um, as you also know, Deborah Kessanon has been providing the agency in a part-time capacity, or has been supporting the agency in a part-time capacity, and even extended her contract to support us through this month. But sadly, her time with us comes to the end on this Friday. I want to thank her as well for her service um, and, and truly uh, for, for helping us get the agency started. Um, hiring. So while we have IAs with DOJ, DCA, and DGS, um, we, in my opinion, need to accelerate hiring of in-house staff to be able to maintain and and um, achieve our desired goals. Uh, as such, we have a, uh, this, the Chief Deputy Director of Administration hiring process underway, um, and the application is, is the applications are being reviewed, and that is um, uh, hopefully going to con conclude uh, in the near future. Um, the GC, the General Counsel position, also just closed, and application review is now underway. Um, my next priority will be hiring an HR liaison to uh, effectively allow us to hire more expediently. Um, additionally, I'm working to establish key positions to accelerate hiring. This is establishing them in the system, as well as work with DGS to streamline operations to make hiring move more quickly um, uh, as we're, as we're um, uh, figuring out our, our resources. Um, I also want to continue to work with DOJ to obtain needed resources that they can, additional needed resources if they can provide. Um, we've had positive discussions with them in the past and we're hoping that they're able to step up um, uh, and, and give us the support we need, the additional support we need. Um, rulemaking, the invitation for comments closed last week and we received several do dozen comments um, and I want to thank the public for, for contributing those comments. Um, we're processing those comments and they will be made available on our website um, once they're completed. Uh, moving forward, I'm focused on uh, resources to help support the rulemaking and to support hiring. Those are my primary priorities and I um, hope to take the board's feedback on whether those priorities are in line with what the board uh, considers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sultani. Are there um, comments or questions from the board? Um, I think we figured out last time we used this platform that the icon doesn't show up for us. So if you could physically raise your hand, um, I will recognize you if you have any comments or questions. Yes, Mr. Lay. Um, yeah, I was asking about, you know, beyond that, uh, that first hire, um, you know, any thoughts around hiring someone to do uh, some of the outreach and PR work, um, you know, someone to help with the informational hearings, you know, convene those that aren't traditionally at these conversations, um, and then, you know, educate Californians on their rights, someone to kind of start those efforts. Um, just any thoughts on that? Thank you, Mr. Lay. Indeed, I think. Indeed, I think that um, after the HR liaison, we essentially, uh, as well as establishing the roles um, so that we don't need to create a justification for each role, my, um, my next task will be to identify what are the key, uh, key functional roles, key senior roles that we need, and, and that would absolutely be one of them. 
um, uh, as, as they will be involved in the rulemaking process as well as our rulemaking lead. I think those would probably be logically the next kind of the next two. There's also some kind of infrastructure leads that we need around finance and around um, you know additional um, you know uh, public affairs type of, of roles. Uh, my hope is to be able to do that in parallel since um, thus far we've been doing hiring in, in serial and I don't think that's serving um, kind of serving the speed that we need. But absolutely, um, I, I do understand there will be some additional conversations about um, how to structure that outreach and potentially um, obtain resources to do that. I'm looking forward to that discussion. Thank you, Mr. Soltani. Ms. De La Torre? Thank you, Chair Irvin. Uh, I was um, hoping to get an update on the plans for the hiring of the auditor. As I understand, that's a key position. And also there's some differences in terms of the processes that it has to go through because it is um, called out within CPRA. Is there uh, an idea or expectation in terms of the timing for it? Is it going to happen soon or are we waiting for the enforcement process to start to think about that hiring? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Mr. Sultani? Um, so that's a great question. I haven't personally um, made any um, inquiries as to that. I know the startup committee, startup subcommittee was considering uh, that piece initially. My personal opinion is that, as you say, um, since we're currently a far way off from enforcement um, and we're still in the process of defining or in the rulemaking, um, outlining the audit authority, that doesn't to me seem like a priority, but that is a board appointment. And so I will delegate or defer to the board in terms of when to make that hire. Um, for me, each staff, you know, onboarding, given that we don't have HR to bring in, each staff onboarding uh, still takes time. And so uh, the my priorities, as I said, is to have the HR liaison who can handle some of this work, then the rulemaking leads, as well as the outreach leads to help, you know, do the public engagement portion um, where we can get rulemaking underway and then think about some of the other tasks that we have for enforcement and auditing, et cetera. But again, the, the, the auditor is um, in your purview or is in the board's purview. And so I defer to the board as to when or what would be appropriate for the timing of that hire. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. I think getting the HR liaison is crucially important because that person actually supports all of the rest. Um, the, the chief privacy auditor, of course, could provide input on, for example, the, the, the um, agency's audit authority uh, and that kind of thing. So um, if, if the board wants to um, talk about kind of where to slot that position in, um, we could absolutely do that. Mr. Thompson? Yeah, Mr. Thompson? Uh, thank you, Chair Urban. Um, and thank you for the update, Mr. Sultani. Um, probably use a number of hackneyed meta, uh, cliches during my questioning of you, but one is, you know, obviously what you're doing is a classic example of building a plane while you're flying it. Um, as you're trying to triage what you need to do, one, I would agree with you, you were seeking feedback on the prioritization, which I think your prioritization is correct. Um, but there's you, you have to keep spinning and start spinning a lot of plates simultaneously. So I think that's two or three hackneyed cliches I've used thus far. Um, I, I don't want to lose sight of the need to have some deliberation and thoughtfulness. I don't mean deliberation necessarily in the meeting sense, but on what an org design process looks like and what, you know, we're, we're talking about adding people and functions, which make good sense, but having an overall, you know, what, what is the organization going to look like um, as, as, as you and we partner to build it, I think is an important thing to, to not lose sight on. Um, and some of this will come up later in the meeting, but, you know, we, we find ourselves in a unique position. I think I've heard you say this as well, that we have budget, but we don't have people. Um, and that, that creates some unique challenges, uh, but maybe some opportunities for creative problem solving, creative solutions to, to find other ways to, to uh, others other than permanent hires, as you've already done, um, bringing in groups of people uh, to get these processes moving. So 
Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Sierra? Yes, thank you, Chair Urban, and um, thank you to our Executive Director, Mr. Sultani. I just wanted also, um, you'd ask for feedback on your suggestions on priorities um, for moving forward, and I very much agree with that path, you know, of working parallel with the rulemaking and the hiring. Um, they're both vitally important, as we all know, and I really like the idea of working towards a serial hiring you know, and I think that, you know, the the hires that you're identifying, you know, the HR um, outreach and rulemaking, I think will really um, are very key. They'll be key positions and will give us a lot of, I don't know if economies of scale is the right term, but I think we'll, it will really help then move things forward uh, much more quickly in my view. And once, you know, we start looking um, as an agency at civil service positions, you know, then that will can give us the infrastructure we need to be able to do that more serial hiring. So um, I very much agree with that. Um, I just think that we're still in, you know, the situation where we have to build that key infrastructure. So thank you. I, I think this is, um, you know, really good plan. And in terms of the privacy auditor, um, my personal view is that while the person um, brought on for that role, um, will be helpful, you know, with respect to rulemaking in addition to enforcement, given all of our priorities and um, issues that we are dealing with right now, and given that we really want to focus on infrastructure so that we have that strong foundation. My view is holding that position off for a bit makes a, makes sense, um, given that enforcement will not be happening for a while under the uh, proposition. But thank you for everything you're doing. Really much appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Further comments from the board? All right, um, I, uh, I echo um, other board members. Thanks to you, Mr. Sultani. Uh, it's been really impressive to watch you. Um, I'm gonna follow up Mr. Thompson with another cliche, hit the ground running, which I, um, I think we can safely say that you have absolutely done and um, look forward to hearing more about your plans um, in future meetings. So thank you for that. Are there any comments from the public? And we'll give everyone a minute to gather their thoughts and also for the system too. So Ms. Hurtado, um, anyone who would like to speak? At this time, there is no one that has raised their hand. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. Uh, thank you to the board and again to the executive director um, for the presentation. We can now move to agenda item number three, which is consideration of minutes from prior meetings. This, uh, this agenda item is titled approval of the September 7th and 8th, September 24th and October 18th meetings. As I mentioned in the last meeting, um, we do still have some staffing shortages, and that has resulted in some, um, some tasks still taking extra time. So staff are still working on the September 7th and 8th meeting minutes, which was a two-day meeting. Um, but um, I hope that those will be completed soon. And the September 24th and October 18th minutes are ready and are in the meeting materials um, for today. So I will introduce discussion of those momentarily. I would also um, like to make sure everyone knows that recordings of all meetings to date are available now on our website and on our YouTube channel, so you can uh, watch those. And I'm very grateful to the Office of the Attorney General for um, providing the minute-taking service currently, and especially to Ms. Susan Wayland and Ms. Rachel Fraser for their work on the minutes from October 18th and the minutes today. Um, let's take each set of minutes separately beginning with the minutes from September 24th. Are there any additions or corrections to the September 24th meeting minutes from board members? And again, please just sort of physically raise your hand and I'll call on you if you noticed anything. Okay, they were very short. <laughs> so um, are there any comments from members of the public?
At this time, there are no, no comments. Thank you, Ms. Hurtado. Um, given that, may I have a motion to approve the September 24th, 2021 board meeting minutes as submitted? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Lay. I have a motion from Mr. Thompson and a second from Mr. Lay to approve the September 24th, 2021 board meeting minutes as submitted. Uh, Ms. Hurtado, could you please um, perform the roll call vote? Um, Ms. Delatore? De uh, aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Ms. Urban? Aye. There are five ayes. Thank you, Ms. Hurtado. The motion carries with a vote of five to nothing. Um, I will work with staff and the executive director to remove the draft notations on the minutes and have them posted for the September 24th meeting. Thank you all very much. Um, let's now move to the minutes from the meeting on October 18th. Are there any additions or corrections to the October 18th minutes from board members? And again, please just raise your hand if you um, would like to speak. Excellent, thank you. Are there any comments from the public? There are no comments at this time. Thank you, Ms. Hurtado. Uh, in that case, the board will uh, now vote whether to approve the October 18th, 2021 board meeting minutes as submitted. Uh, May I please have a motion um, for this? Sorry, I can repeat that. I'll, I'll make the motion. Thank you, Mr. Lay. I may have a second. I will second. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. I have a motion from Mr. Lay and a second from Ms. Sierra to approve the October 18, 2021 board meeting minutes as submitted. Ms. Hurtado, would you please perform the roll call vote? Ms. De La Torre? Aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Ms. Urban? Aye. Five to zero. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. The motion carries with a vote of five to zero. And again, I will work with staff um, to remove the draft marking and have the October 18, uh, 2021 minutes um, posted to the website for the public. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, we can now move to agenda item number four, which is an update from the Startup and Administration Subcommittee. As a brief reminder for anybody who hasn't joined previous meetings, the board formed advisory subcommittees during the June 14th and September 7th and 8th board meetings, some of which we'll be reporting today. Bagley Keene allows for subcommittees of two people to act in an advisory capacity for the board. The Startup and Administration um, Subcommittee has focused on um, exactly as it sounds, um, helping with the administrative startup of the um, agency, and it is made up of Ms. Sierra and me. We have a couple of brief updates from our last meeting, and Ms. Sierra is going to provide those. Um, Ms. Sierra? Great. Thank you, Chair Urban. So first, I will um, touch on our hiring. And as our executive director um, discussed earlier in his update, the application periods for both um, the chief deputy director of administration and uh, our agency's general counsel positions have both closed. And um, the review of those applications are underway. Um, with respect to um, additional positions, um, for example, our civil service positions for the agency. Um, we are working, our subcommittee is working with the executive director um, in a supportive role um, to assist with that process. Next turn to um, the subcommittee's work on organizational policies. Um, first, a summary of where we're at and up to where we have been to date. Um, the startup and administration subcommittee has been working over time 
to identify and provide to the board advice on necessary policies for both the agency and the board. Um, Chairperson um, Urban has also sought advice from council before our subcommittee was formed. And that had resulted in the conflict of interest policy that we as a board adopted in our October 18th meeting. That those consultations also resulted in a recommended draft board handbook um, on which Chair Urban had sought feedback um, during our January 14th meeting. Now, after seeking advice from council on necessary timing of policies, um, the subcommittee, we decided to focus first on policies that are required by law or are otherwise necessary for the immediate operation of the board or the agency. Um, with that in mind, um, during the September 7th and 8th meeting, um, the board, um, we adopted as a board a policy um, for administration of our per diem compensation. And our subcommittee has since then been working on an incompatibility, um, incompatible, excuse me, incompatible activities policy. Now, since the October 18th meeting, um, the subcommittee has been able to review um, existing efforts with um, Mr. Souble, who is, um, as you all know, working with us as an interim general counsel. And we've been seeking advice from him on a range of needed policies and how they should be developed. Uh, Mr. Souble is currently doing this review and should have more information for the board soon. So a uh, big shout out and thank you to Mr. Souble. Um, and then moving forward, as our agency has more staff capacity, um, the role of startup and administration going to be really moving and we already are, you know, starting this moving in more of a supportive role on these um, organizational. So that's um, then in my report. Um, are there any questions or comments from the board? Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Uh, Mr. Bruto, would you mind um, muting your microphone? As a creative item. Uh, sorry, Ms. Sierra, for, for for interrupting um, with the administrative item. I, I just wanted to, um, first of all, thank you, Ms. Sierra, for providing this sort of update and a little bit of a timeline um, so people are reminded. As we have um, started to work with the executive director, now that we have an executive director, as Ms. Sierra mentioned, we're thinking of shifting to sort of a supportive role. Um, and as we're very grateful to have Mr. Souble to take a look at policies we need, policies the agency needs, how they all work together with um, requirements under the law um, and state policy um, so that uh, he can give us a, a, a coherent um, plan um, for working through the policy. So we really appreciate that um, and um, have found that uh, providing essentially support is, is a good role for us right now. Um, so are there comments from the board members? Yes, Mr. Thompson. I have a process question um, in that there is a, I think there's some potential, well, I have a, there's a question that I would like to pose to the two members of the subcommittee during the discussion uh, on the rules, rulemaking process subcommittee portion. May I pose the question during this agenda item so that the members of the subcommittee have the time to think about it prior to me posing it during a later agenda item, or would that be an inappropriate mixing of agenda items? Um, well, I, if it is about what our subcommittee sort of is up to and what our role is, it seems to me that it would be appropriate now. I'll ask Mr. Bruder um, to weigh in. Sure, yeah, I agree, it's okay. Oh, yeah, Okay. Uh, please go ahead, Mr. Thompson. But the, the question is about the interaction between the rulemaking subcommittee activities and the startup subcommittees activities and wanted to get the view of, of the members of this subcommittee on where the questions have arised about how the board uh, interacts with the staff or how how the staff supports the board. Uh, there's different models of how um, you can staff an agency and a board such as this and 
Um, you know, do you have one centralized staff that, that supports everybody? Do you have dedicated staff that support different board members? For example, is a, is a question to be posed structurally? Um, so as, as we're working through issues in the rules process subcommittee, we're identifying some of these things. I didn't, uh, Ms. Delatore and myself have been thinking about these things and wanted to get your view on where you view this subcommittee's scope and jurisdiction so that we don't duplicate efforts. I'm going to pose that question to you during our presentation, but since you're talking about it now, I want to just give you the time between your presentation and ours to, to think about it so I didn't hit you cold with that question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Taylor's right. Yes, thank you, Mr. Donsha, for bringing it up right now. We, we, I just wanted to add that the, the, the particular example where this came up is uh, our subcommittee is tasked with supervising the process for these rulemaking uh, activities that we are undergoing right now, but also thinking about in the future, how can we best organize ourselves for future rulemaking efforts? And in that context, you know, the, the idea of in how different boards are organized for rulemaking came up and that has implications also for how the agency is staffed. So that is kind of where the seed of this of this question. We just wanted to have a little bit of a conversation so that we have clarity as to which piece of this should be undertaken by the process of committee versus the startup subcommittee. Thank you. Um, thank you both. We have, um, as we've reported in previous meetings, We've largely limited our activities to um, to hiring, to policies, and to looking into space. So very strictly administrative issues. Um, it may make sense when we get to the the rulemaking process of committee item to hear um, a little bit more specifics about what you run into. Um, Ms. Sierra, did you have did you have any comment? Um. No, I mean, I think this is is an important issue and I, I'm glad that, you know, it's being raised. Um, but I don't see it as what part of the work that we have been doing to date, but I do think this is an important topic moving forward that we all kind of are of, you know, um, on the same page of how we think as a board best to move forward on, you know, staffing for particular subcommittee work um, and the different models as um Mr. Thompson brought up of, you know, how much staff will be doing and what they will be doing um, and how that interplays with the board work. So I guess, yeah, I, I just think, um, and thank you for bringing that up, but I, I agree with you, Chair Urban, that's not something that we have been focusing on as a startup. In a yes, thank you. I, I also generally think to allude back to what Mr. Thompson said when he was describing different models, although I'm not sure this is the context in which you were describing it, Mr. Thompson. I generally think that now that we have, if minimal, some staff support, that often uh, staff are in the best position to sort of direct traffic between the subcommittees because they have insight and we cannot because of Bagley Keene. Of course, there may be sort of bigger ticket items that um, it would be useful for us to talk about as a board. Um, so perhaps again, when we get to the rulemaking process item, as you go through how you've been thinking about that, um, we can comment on if there are pieces that we should take on or could take on um, or, or not. And, um, does that make sense? Is that in line with what you were both thinking, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson? Okay. Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And obviously with the, the strictures that we operate under, we haven't been able, you know, the, the purpose was really just to, to get your thoughts started and, and Mr. Lay's thoughts started so that we could have a robust discussion, a couple agenda items from now. So thank okay. you for the indulgence. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you both um, for bringing that to our attention. Are there any other comments or questions from the board? All right, thanks everyone. Are there any comments um, from the audience?
There are no comments at this time. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. Uh, with that, then, I will thank everyone for the discussion. Ms. Sierra and I will keep in mind the item that Mr. Thompson and Ms. De La Torre flagged for us. Uh, and I think you'll see uh, it's, it, it, it's a good uh, topic um, to, to go into the next item with, uh, which is the update of CCPA rules subcommittee. Um, this is agenda item number five. And again, as a bit of a background, um, the board uh, on June 14th formed a regulation subcommittee to advise on the agency's upcoming rulemaking. That subcommittee was comprised of Ms. De La Torre and me. Um, in the September 7th and 8th board meeting, Ms. De La Torre and I recommended and the board agreed to replace the regulation subcommittee with three different subject matter based subcommittees, which continue to advise the board on rulemaking. Uh, we then dissolved our regulation subcommittee. The uh, existing three subcommittees are the new uh, California Privacy Rights Act Rules Subcommittee, which is covering things that are entirely new from the initiative in um, 2020. The update of California Consumer Privacy Act Rules Subcommittee, um, which is looking at the existing rules that the Attorney General's Office promulgated under the CCPA um, and updating as, uh, recommending updates as needed to those rules, and the rulemaking process subcommittee to which Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson alluded under our last subject, um, uh, our last agenda item, uh, which is charged with making recommendations about how we accomplish the rulemaking process. Um, two subcommittees will be providing updates today, starting with the update of CCPA rules subcommittee, which is composed of Ms. Sierra and me. Um, we, uh, we have a sort of a brief update and wanted to flag um, a process question uh, for the rulemaking process subcommittee. Um, so we've been uh, continuing to work um, with a set of topics um, uh, that was developed by the regulation subcommittee and assigned to us um, on September 7th and 8th, um, along with um, an additional topic which was assigned to us in the October 18th meeting, the definition of business purposes. Uh, at that time, we had identified um, a few additional items to consider for the future, um, intentionally interacts, uh, definition of dark patterns, a couple of other things. And we noted that there may be other um, items that could come up. Ms. Sierra and I have reviewed the slides that the rulemaking process subcommittee provided for today's meeting. And we see that um, your subcommittee has done a lot of careful thought regarding allocating, uh, allocating topics. Um, we really appreciate your work here and we fully support it. Um, we thought that it was most appropriate to discuss the specifics of that during process subcommittee agenda item. So I won't make any detailed remarks on that. Um, however, in addition to supporting the process subcommittee's allocation recommendations, uh, we would like to propose that the allocation process for individual topics um, be completed today and that staff takes over advising subcommittee on a, any additional topics that come up that they should consider. Um, for example, so we think the big ticket items um, at this point have basically been allocated, but that subcommittees might still be running into things as they do their work. And um, it is difficult to, for us all to communicate and figure out sort of how to allocate those, but staff can do that. And I have two examples um, that hopefully will make this concrete. On October 18th, I mentioned one, which is um, uh, section 999.301K of the existing regulations defines household, um, but section 1798.14Q, I think it is, of the, um, Cal the California Privacy Rights Act has a, has a new definition of household in the statute. So um, it seems as though the update subcommittee probably should do something about that, um, but it wasn't on any of our list. Um, and then secondly, um, as another kind of example, uh, our subcommittee is responsible for integrating the new right to correction. Um, and um, one of the places that, as we've been reading through, it looks like that needs to be integrated is the regulation relating to privacy policies. Um, 
which, it, uh, which is already exists in the regulations, but it wasn't included um, on our list. It probably is okay, but we were concerned that if somebody else is looking at that regulation, um, then we haven't kept ourselves separate under Bagley So our recommendation um, is that, again, we now turn to staff to advise and direct, direct traffic. Um, and, you know, I think they can let us know if we start to drift too close to another subcommittee's work without revealing anything that couldn't be revealed under Bagley Keene. Um, and um, uh, that will be an efficient way to move forward uh, with thanks for the process subcommittee's really helpful work so far. Um, I recommend that we leave this request here again for reintroduction and discussion during the process subcommittee's agenda item. Um, but I'm open to what people would like and also what Mr. Bruder thinks is appropriate. Um, so with that, um, Ms. Sierra, did you have anything to add? Um, no, no, I don't. Thank you. Okay. Um, any comments or questions from other board members? Yes, Ms. De La Torre. Just a short um, comment to, to say that we generally agree with um, would you have proposed it seems like we were basically thinking about the same things in the same way and I think it's appropriate to address it in the next um, action uh, in the next item yes other comments from board members all right are there any comments from the public Uh, we have one comment, one moment, and I'll, while I get them um, ready to speak. Thank you. Edwin Lombard, you've been unmuted. You have three minutes. Uh, yes. Uh, um, good morning, Madam Chair Urban, board members of the California Privacy Protection Agency and Executive Director Sotani. My name is Edwin Lombard. I'm the President Emeritus of the African California African American Chamber of Commerce. Um, and today I want to represent the Chambers of Commerce, the Black Chambers of Commerce, the Black Business Association, and the California Association of Black Pastors. As a leader of the minority-owned businesses, my time and energy are dedicated to creating a predictable and positive business environment to help small business stay on their feet and thrive in the state of California. Small businesses, particularly minority-owned small businesses, are the lifeblood of California's economy. The NAACP recently did a study and they found that 5% of all small businesses in the state of California are owned by African Americans and nearly a quarter by Latinos. When these businesses are open, they provide valuable goods and services in the community throughout the state. As we all know, COVID had an irre irreversible impact on small businesses in the state of California. In fact, 43% of all black small businesses went out of business during COVID. And while we all seem uh, to be, while they all seem to be crawling out of the pandemic, small businesses cannot afford additional regulations that could impact their economic recovery. On behalf of the organizations I represent here today, we understand the charge of CPPA under Prop 2024, which is to protect the privacy of consumers. While many may think that CPPA's forthcoming regulations may only impact large companies, I am here today to remind you that CPPA, remind CPPA that minority-owned small businesses who serve many minority consumers may also be impacted as well. Yes, consumer privacy should be protected, but it needs to be balanced, a balanced approach in that the CPPA regulatory products does not have a disparate impact on communities of color. Stated in another way, a balanced approach means the CPPA regulation should be reasonable, practical, but most importantly, compliant with CPPA regulations do not lead to a closure of minority-owned businesses, which ultimately hurt minority consumers as well. 
Our organizations are prepared to work with CPPA and other stakeholders. I love the work that you are doing here today. I just want you to keep in mind the fact that small businesses are the backbone of the state of California. What you do today determines how small businesses exist in this state. I do have two questions and then you can address them however you want to. Uh, but what is the CPPA's process in reconciling regulations with the Attorney General's office to address conflicting provisions and ambiguities with the upcoming regulations, number one? Number two, will CPPA amend the AG regulations or will the AG have their own regulatory process to fix conflicting uh, provisions and ambiguities in the upcoming regulations? Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Lombard, for your very helpful comment and for your two questions. Uh, with regard to the first, the, um, the, um, uh, the CPRA um, directs the board to update the existing regulations in certain ways, um, and certainly we wouldn't want to create um, conflict. I think that's part of what we were just talking about um, in figuring out how to allocate information. Uh, with regard to the second, um, which I understand to be uh, essentially, will there be two sets of regulations or one? I think I'd like to defer that to the rulemaking process subcommittee. Um, although uh, my understanding is uh, our job is to amend and add to the regulations where necessary. Uh, but I think that is the most appropriate um, uh, question for the rulemaking process subcommittee. And I would say um, to Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson, um, if you wanted to jot down Mr. Lombard's question and answer it under your agenda item, that would be fine. Or if you wanted to respond now, uh, that would also be fine. Just let me know. Salatory? I, I believe that we can respond now. Um, the um, one thing that is very important for all of the public to remember is that even though in terms of the um, enforcement, this agency will share the authority to enforce the law with the California Attorney General's Office. In regards to rulemaking, DPRA basically transfers that responsibility away from the California Attorney General and into this agency. We have been working really closely with the California Attorney General's Office and will remain um, to, we will continue to work closely with them during the uh, rulemaking process and also during the enforcement process. But the answer, the specific answer to the question of whether we will have two sets of rules or one is that we will have, at the end of the process, one set of rules that will be promulgated by this agency and that will be based on the existing rules as updated to account for the requirements of the PRA. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. And again, thank you, Mr. Lombard, for your comment. Ah, Mr. Thompson. Um, I want to thank Mr. Lombard for, for his comments and for his questions. And you know, I think this is an area where we as a board, but also as multiple subcommittees, the, the topic of addressing the diverse needs of this state uh, is is at the forefront of our thinking. Um, it's always helpful to be reminded of the impacts on minority businesses, on African American businesses. So I appreciate I appreciate the comment and the reminder. Um, I have a question uh, either for our general counsel or for the chairperson regarding. I, I think this actually is the first time we we've had a comment that posed a question to us. Um, my recollection of our process is that when we take public comment, um, we, we receive the comment, but don't necessarily engage in responding to questions posed. Um, and I just, uh, because it's been a while since we had that, that first um, kind of, uh, a briefing on, on how to run a public meeting, I just wanted to double check that that, that was the process. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, generally, yes. Um, Mr. Lombard asked a couple of pretty straightforward factual questions. So um, I made a decision in the moment, but generally we take in public comment um, and we consider those um, as we do our work. Uh, Mr. Sibley or Mr. Bruder, did you want to comment further? 
No, I think you're correct with, with your response, Chair Urban. Thank you. And again, thank you, Mr. Lombard, um, for your important observations um, and intervention. Uh, do we have any further public comment? Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Julian Canetti. You've been unmuted. You have three minutes. Julian Canetti. Well, I see him there, but he's, I don't know if we just can't hear him. All right. Um, we can come back to him. Okay. He, he was the last commenter, Mr. Kinnett. I'll try okay. and work with him. And if, um, if he's able to comment, then we can um, bring him on in the next round. All right. I don't know how that works. Um, well, if he's commenting on this agenda item, it's best under this agenda item, but we also have an agenda item for public comment on any topic. Um, so um, that would also be an opportunity um, if you need to work with him in order to um, provide a way for him, uh, him to comment. And we will look forward to that um, under that agenda item. Uh, all right, thanks everyone. Um, Ms. Hurtado, he was the last public commenter, I think you said, on this topic. Um, yes. So Wonderful. So um, thanks to everyone um, for their comments. Um, and with that, um, um, uh, we can move to uh, agenda item number six, which is the uh, update from the rulemaking process subcommittee, um, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson. I will now uh, turn things over to them. Thank you, Chairman Irvin. I know there's a presentation for this update. Uh, maybe we can project it. And while we're working on that, um, I was going to explain that the presentation is divided into three different pieces. The initial part is just an opportunity for all of us to better understand the differences between the general rulemaking process and the emergency rulemaking process. We have uh, Mr. Souble with us. He is our interim general counsel. He has extensive experience with rulemaking process in his prior roles. And he has offered to provide this presentation and just be available for all board members to ask questions so that we have all clarity on how those two different processes work. The second piece of this presentation We'll talk about next steps and general recommendations. Mr. Thomas is going to be um, presenting that piece, and that might be a good opportunity for us to stop and have the conversation that we talked about before as to how we envision the dividing um, responsibilities between this subcommittee and the startup subcommittee. The last part of the presentation is just a proposal for assignment of pending topics. Uh, this was also brought up as well. There will be an action item for us to vote on in that part of the presentation. I will be presenting it, and that will be an opportunity for us maybe um, to talk about how do we um, address future potential topics that maybe were not listed in the initial presentation, and uh, how we can take the benefit from the fact that we now have the staff to to make sure that those get allocated wisely and, and we don't um, create situations where we are both, uh, we have multiple subcommittees working on the same thing. So with that, I just wanna um, give the opportunity to Mr. Souple to take over the presentation. If we could move, I think it's slide three and the slide that provides a visual of the regular rulemaking process. Thank you so much, Mr. Souple, for agreeing to um, help us understand better these two important processes. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Um, slide three is a very good visual representation of the regular rulemaking process. And one thing that we should keep in mind is the California Administrative Procedures Act, and I'll refer to it as the APA, is designed to allow um, and facilitate public participation in an agency's rulemaking process. 
And, and so what the slide is representing is first is the steps that go through a rulemaking. And really, if you look at that upper right corner um, with the boxes that deal with the notice of proposed, rule, proposed rulemaking, initial statement of reasons, and text of regulations, you actually want to flip that over. Because in any rulemaking, what is the driving factor is the text of the regulation. Um, from that, you'll get your um, initial statement of reasons and then your notice. Once you have your notice, which is filed with the Office of Administrative Law, um, when it publishes that in the California Notice Register, that opens your 45-day comment period, which is typically a written comment period. Uh, most agencies follow that up shortly after, either the day after the written comment period closes or within the week after it closes with um, a public hearing. Um, not all rulemakings require a public hearing, but on, on complex procedures, you, the, the typical course is to have a, um, a public hearing with respect to it. The whole point of that is to gather comments from the public on the proposal. The agency then gets into a phase of analyzing those comments. Um, it is required to respond to the comments in its rulemaking file. Once that file is composed, uh, um, um, uh, finalized, it is submitted with a final statement of reasons to the Office of Administrative Law for approval. Um, once a 45-day uh, a comment period opens, the agency has um, a 12-month period of time to submit that final rulemaking uh, file to the Office of Administrative Law for approval. Um, if approved by OAL, they then go into effect once filed with the Secretary of State, usually the same day as the approval occurs. If there is a disapproval, the agency has an opportunity for an additional 120 day, 120 day period to make any corrections that could avoid that disapproval. Um, if you move to slide four, can we move to slide four, please? Um, the second way um, a regulation can be adopted is on an emergency basis. Um, to, to do that, the agency has to meet what is the factual standard for an emergency, which the, um, the, the APA defines as um, to avoid serious harm to the public, peace, health, safety, or general welfare. Um, and so to, to get that, you either have to have statutory authority or to meet that, that definition of what emergency is. Um, currently, uh, none of the, the statutes that we're implementing actually grants us the ability to, to do an emergency regulation um, without meet, so we would have to meet that factual criteria. But um, it's a very abbreviated process. The agency sends out a notice. Um, there's a five-day comment period. The regulation is, is also submitted to OAL. Um, there is a 10-day period in addition to that for OAL review and public comment. Um, the agency doesn't necessarily have to respond to those public comments. Um, OAL can request that they respond to specific comments. If approved, if the emergency is approved, the regulations are effective for 180 days. Um, at that point in time, the agency either submits the, the full rulemaking package to Office of Administrative Law uh, within that 180-day period, or it is, has the opportunity for two additional 90-day periods um, to extend the emergency regulation. If we move to slide five, um, just, it just gives you a, a good illustration of what the pros and cons are, are doing for doing an emergency regulation. Those rules become enforceable upon uh, publication, which is after the OAL approval. Um, as I mentioned, the cons require either we meet that, that um, factual definition of, a, of an emergency or there has to be a legislative um, grant of authority to do an emergency regulation. Um, the only issue with the emergency rulemaking is that you have more of a minimal um, uh, opportunity for the public to provide input. You don't have a 45-day period. It's, it's really condensed down to a five-day period. Um, and so that's kind of the overview of the entire uh, rulemaking process. So I'll take any questions if anyone has. Does any board member have a question for Mr. Souvlet? Um, I also wanted to mention, of course, that uh, Mr. Souvlet remains available for questions after this meeting if something doesn't come up right now, but there are questions in the in the future that come up in the process of, of, the, of the different subcommittees. Thank you, Ms. Taylor-Torrey. Um, everyone's 
a photo uh, video is quite small, <laughs> so I will try to keep a lookout for hands. I, I do have a question uh, for Mr. Souffle, if that's all right, on the emergency rulemaking. My understanding is that it's more the timing of public input that changes. So the emergency rules take effect, but then after that, there's a full rulemaking process. And I wanted to check if that was correct, number one. And number two, I suppose the question of the um, uh, concentration or amount of public input, in part, would depend on the agency uh, undertaking the emergency rulemaking and whether they had time and um, did solicit a lot of public input um, on the front end. Uh, for example, like the invitation for comments that we um, already put out as part of our preliminary rulemaking. My understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that an agency could do um, any amount of public input through preliminary processes before uh, doing an emergency rulemaking, so that there would be public input before then the emergency rulemaking, and then a full um, regular rulemaking after the uh, emergency process. Is that correct? That is correct. The, the APA actually encourages um, public participation in, in the pre-drafting um, stage. And so it requires, if it, if it is a complex proposal or one that has numerous uh, provisions that, that really would require a lot of work during the regular 45-day period, the agency should um, um, involve the public in discussions during, that, that, during the preliminary stages. In past agencies that I worked for, we would hold um, public workshops um, and invite members of the public to attend the workshops, either based on an agenda or actually a draft set of, of the rulemaking so that they could have an opportunity to comment even in the drafting process. So, so even if you do the emergency rulemaking procedure, there is the, the, the opportunity for public discussions while drafting the regulation. Um, the, the second part is even if you um, adopt um, an emergency regulation, you still have to go through the full regular rulemaking proceeding in that 360-day period. Um, so you would have to um, do a 45-day notice and, and accept you know, the, the regular written comments as well as hold a, a public hearing. So while adopting the emergency rulemaking has a, um, a, a lesser um, degree of public participation other than outside of the, the, the preliminary activities, um, there is always the opportunity for the full public participation because you have to adopt it as a regular rulemaking. Thank you very much, Mr. Sibley, for that clarification. Welcome. Any other comments or questions from board members? Uh, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson, um, I'll hand it back. Thank you. Um, if we can move on to the next set of slides, um, the next steps and recommendations. So, Ms. Delatore and myself have been meeting uh, regularly and, and working through an understanding of, of the process and the interaction between uh, the variety of processes that exist. Um, sorry, could you advance the slide one more, please? Um, and the, obviously the addition of, of staff resources and, and support during those meetings has been vital. So I wanted to thank Mr. Sultani and Mr. Souble for their participation and support as we move forward. Um, some, some next steps, and this was mentioned in Mr. Sultani's update, that the public, com the public comment on initial rulemaking process that we've instituted is closed. And so comments have been received and can be reviewed by the CPPA Rules Update Subcommittee and the CPRA, the new CPRA Rules Subcommittee. So those those are clear next steps um, in our processes. We, we note that um, the rules subcommittees um, will continue to work with, with the executive director and the staff on informational hearings. You'll, it'll, you'll see it on the next slide, but this is also an important support role for the Public Awareness Subcommittee. Uh, that I'm also happen to be a member of, and Mr. Lay and myself uh, have been working with the staff to identify a suite of, of public hearings that we could institute and recommend. Let me put that in a different order: recommend and institute um, uh, to 
garner public participation and increase public awareness and education. Um, a major milestone in our process will be the development of the text of, of, of the regulations uh, and the statement of reasons. So um, you know, that, that is what we're driving towards collectively and, and will be a, a major milestone for, for all of us. Um, as has been noted, the resource constraints that we operate under are, are a major bottleneck in our, in our process. And we've been thinking about how do we uh, prioritize and sequence activities so that we can apply the limited resources we have um, so that we will continue to, to work on those issues and, and come up with some recommendations for the, the full board. Um, like, again, resources for informational hearings are also a challenge. Uh, as has been noted, we have budget, but we don't have the people. So we've been considering what are what are some innovative or um, creative solutions to identify resources that could support our rulemaking and our informational hearings um, other than permanent hires, which as, as, as we are all well aware, uh, is a process that, um, that has, has slowed down the, the staffing and, and resourcing of this agency. Um, the, the, the complexity of these topics, um, both in the drafting of regulations, but also, you know, how they affect a range of stakeholders in the state, as, as was noted in, in the public comment earlier. Uh, but the need to ensure that people understand the rights that they have and how the requirements of our regulations uh, or potential draft regulations will affect operations of, of various businesses, but also the rights uh, and, and abilities of consumers to protect themselves. Um, you'll see that some potential solutions that are noted there. We're going to continue to work with, with Mr. Soltani and the staff to generate a list of options. You saw one of them um, that, that was presented, but I think it would be helpful to the board to see it a comprehensive look at th this is the range of options that we have process wise um, to to prioritize the regulations as we uh, draft them and implement them and, and utilizing different processes that are available to us under the APA as, as Mr. Stuble noted and with the pro with the pros and cons uh, as we see them so that we can collectively deliberate on on what we think the trade-offs are um, you know the, the speed with which we need to act um, the statutory deadlines that we need to meet, the resource challenges that we have, the need for, for public involvement in education. You know, there's a lot of moving parts that go into this process. So I think um, look at a, at a future meeting at a, at a more robust consideration of here's four to six options for moving forward. Here are the pros and cons and let's, let's deliberate on them. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide. Uh, I think I covered some of the, these points, um, but continuing to explore the options, uh, as, as was discussed, emergency rulemaking, we have talked in the past about uh, potentially delaying enforcement of, of promulgated rules um, as a way of getting, rule, getting rules implemented uh, on an expedited basis, but um, mitigating potential impacts on, on the regulated entities. How we are going to um, lay out the, the the timelines and packages and 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 the pros and cons, I think I, I touched on already. Um, we have an action item coming up, uh, which uh, Ms. De La Torre will will step us through to allocate the topics on the on the next section. Um, and I, I mentioned already looking at some creative ways to bring a bring on board additional resources in, in maybe greater numbers and, and faster to support the, the rulemaking subcommittees. Um, one of the things, and I'm, this is, I'm going to move to the, the posing the question to, I think maybe we could, um, I think it might be helpful to see the video of each other and we can maybe um, minimize the presentation momentarily. I don't know if it's difficult, Ms. Hurtado, to take it down and put it back up. 
Um, but the, the question that, well, one, wanted to have a discussion on just the next steps and recommendations as they exist, but in particular, um, the, the question which Chairperson Urban and, and Ms. Sierra, I think you, you kind of preliminary, <laughs> preliminarily already answered, but as we've been working through things, we've seen questions arise um, in discussions with staff and others. For example, you know, what, what are comparable boards and agencies that whose processes we can can look to to benchmark and guide us as we develop our own processes. Um, how does the how do we think of the the subcommittees interacting with each other? How do we think of the board operating as a as a function? And whether or not those were things that the the startup subcommittee would look at, or or things that the rules process subcommittee should look at, or perhaps another solution. Um, as was noted, I think Chairperson Urban, by you, you know, working with the staff, uh, particularly Mr. Soltani, um, is, is critical to a lot of these things because uh, the staff have visibility across the, the subcommittees that, that we necessarily do not have. So relying upon their recommendations while, while continuing to operate in a badly clean compliant way, but the staff have, have recommendations, uh, obviously those are critical to how we move forward. So I'll, I'll take a step back and just and kind of tee up uh, and, and uh, Ms. Delatory jump in where where you want to um, yeah. buy additional questions. But we, we've talked about this board was was based upon in the initiative the Fair Political Practices Commission. There are a number of boards and agencies that that operate um, dozens, um, some with kind of smaller jurisdictions or professional licensing um, jurisdiction. Some with with very broad policy making and enforcement roles. So, who do we compare ourselves to? Are there a set of kind of peer organizations that we should look at um, and and start to establish our board processes and how the board interacts with the staff? Um, that's a high level question. Uh, I think uh, Lydia, if you want to jump in, sorry, Ms. Delatory, if you want to jump in and give a couple of uh, examples of where that this has come up. And we could maybe have a board discussion on that topic and then anything else related to the next steps and recommendations. Of course, thank you so much. Um, and I just wanted to give like the concrete example where this um, conversation came up. We were thinking about how can we improve on our process for rulemaking towards the future, right? Like how we organize ourselves to be actively engaged in not only now generating the rules, but maintaining the rules because our rulemaking authority obviously doesn't end in a year or two. And in that context, uh, we were thinking it might be helpful for us to reach out to other agencies and have conversations with board members of other agencies that have similar responsibilities and come back to the board. This is not an urgent thing, obviously, right? Like there are other urgent things, but come up to the board and, and suggest, look, this is a model, maybe the FTC is one model of how a board can be organized. Um, there's other different models so that we can start to think together about how we wanna be operating once we're fully staffed, basically. And in that context, we were thinking, well, if we are gonna have a conversation with um, potentially you know, board members from other agencies in California, we might gather information not only as to how they function for rulemaking, but also how they function to supervise budget or supervise other things. I, I'm just coming up with ideas here. And so it might make sense for us to gather all of that information as opposed to just narrowing it down to rulemaking only if we're gonna have those conversations. And then it came up, well, but are we maybe now walking into an area where the start as a committee might be working? My, my initial reaction was I always, thought about the startup subcommittee as thinking about things more from the agency perspective as opposed to from the board perspective. But there is obviously a line there where both things have to interact. So we don't need to solve for this, but we thought this would be an opportunity for us to have a conversation to better understand how the startup subcommittee is thinking about their, their work moving forward. And, and we can always, through a staff like we have been mentioning, you know, operate to solve any you know, particular situation and just allocate it correctly, but just have this 
overall vision of whether the board will agree with us as a process of committee having conversations with other board members, um, sorry, members of other boards and kind of proposing models um, kind of at a, at a high level uh, for us to consider. And that's that's one, one thing. And then whether, um, you know, that, that will be aligned with what the other subcommittees are doing. There was a, a second piece of this uh, that Mr. Thompson alluded to, which is staffing. And obviously the startup subcommittee is really deep into how do we make the agency function. Uh, but from the process of committee perspective, we're thinking, is there something that can be done, not in terms of just you know, staffing the agency, but particular resources that might be brought to this particular rulemaking process that can help us, not permanent resources, but you know, temporary resources. And is that something that will fall within the process of committee, or is that something that will be better allocated within the startup subcommittee? Um, one thing, one example here, because I think examples are really helpful, was um, is there a way where we can perhaps um, obtain some assistance from um, the um, University of California? There's experts within the University of California that we might be able to reach out to, and that's not a staffing situation. That's just maybe an advisory board kind of kind of um, thing. So um, we, I think, um, Mr. Thompson, I think that we we expose our <laughs> kind of the, the way we were thinking about this enough, but we're open to um, your questions and we look forward to your feedback. Thank you both. Um, questions or comments from the board? Um, I am to some degree digesting what you said. Uh, which is the function of, of a public meeting like this. Um, it seems to me, and this may be a question for Mr. Sible and Mr. Bruder, that uh, there are certain things that we could talk about in a public meeting so that we all kind of head off knowing what each of us is going to do. And then there are other things that we could rely on staff to, again, to direct traffic for us. Um, and I'm not, I think it probably depends on the specific item, um, but that a variety, for a fair amount of things, staff could direct traffic. Um, but uh, is it, are, is the process subcommittee requesting that the startup administration subcommittee take on resources for certain things? I think that's something that we could do or Alternatively, it might make sense to stay with your subcommittee because you know exactly what you need. Um, but if we have clear direction, or, you know, we, we know what we're doing, what we're being asked to do, um, that may be something that we could pursue. Ms. Sierra, what do you think? Yes, I think, yeah, I think there's just kind of a couple of different layers, you know, to the issue. Um, so, you know, a couple of, you know, thoughts. And the various layers, like for the for the one of the um, last items mentioned about getting additional resources or kind of creative ways of getting resources and maybe reaching out to the UCs. Um, I think you know I think those those are really interesting, be really interesting ideas, and I think and there may be you know additional ones like that. I kind of see that type of thing as as board members, you know, bringing those up, and that to me could be something for a staff, their executive director you know, then, then to pursue, you know, or think about, because then he will be also, he may already be doing that, you know, and, and, look, and look, he's looking at resources for both the, um, the board and the agency. And as Chair Urban had mentioned, and I had mentioned during our subcommittee updates has, you know, when we first um, were developed as subcommittees, you know, we didn't have any staff. Now we have an executive director. And so, you know, we had, you know, sort of taken the lead in the beginning before we had staff. Now we have our executive director. We'll be bringing on more staff shortly. And we are seeing ourselves more in a supportive role. So I think, you know, these board meetings are, you know, one very important function is to be able to provide guidance and advice so that our executive director can understand where we're each coming from and give him ideas. And it seemed like the most, to me, most efficient ways for him 
and to be taking the lead on, on that and seeking the resources. Um, I personally have also seen our startup and administrative um, subcommittee really focus mostly on the agency, as a member de la Torre, you know, noted, um, versus kind of this interaction between staff and the board. Um, but there is overlap, as we all know, because we have all, you know, it's all come up in, as we've already discussed, there's um, various subcommittees about what would be the best way to move forward so we can be as efficient and agile and effective as possible. Um, so I am very supportive of this idea as our recommendation, being staff kind of you know, direct our traffic. I want to make sure I'm not losing, um, they know there's different, various different points. The other issue I guess we have to talk about or you brought up is, you know, looking at other boards and, and how we best, if we want to learn about what other boards are doing, you know, which I think, you know, is a, is a really good idea, but how do we want to do it? How organized do we want to do it to make sure that, you know, the, you know, we're not um, duplicating our effort? And I'm sort of in my mind kind of processing, you know, what would be the best way to do that, um, to get that information and share it. Because um, I do think it's important as we speak, if we were to do that, also if there's, it could be on, you know, the surface, the boards are very similar to ours, but then, you know, there may be very nuanced differences that we need to, you know, for example, on some boards, I think, for example, at PPC, the chair is a full-time salaried employee versus as a part-time, you know, member of a volunteer board. But I don't have off the top of my head, I'm kind of thinking through that um, idea about um, getting information for um, from other boards. Um, the other thing that uh, is a slightly different topic, but that chair, I mean, that um, board member Thompson brought up in his presentation about looking at our various options, you know, and some are, you know, include bringing on more but there are other options to their challenges. I really um, am very supportive of the idea of looking at a comprehensive um, review of that with pros and cons. I think that would be um, really helpful because, you know, as we all know, that these are not easy questions for us to solve. So those are my immediate reactions to that. But again, it's kind of thinking through how best can we, if we want to learn about other boards, do it in a way that we're not duplicating efforts and we can do it in a way that's most effective. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Um, other comments from board members? I have a, go ahead, Ms. Sierra. I'm sorry, you know, one last thought, I just, I don't know if I just say this, but, you know, my general view of though, like how the model that we should, or that I would, you know, propose following, I, you know, without making any final decisions and thinking further about this, but really looking at the model where staff is running the day-to-day -day operations, making the decisions for the agency, and that we are really here to provide um, insight guidance and where necessary, you know, direction on, on policy matters. You know, so I think as a big picture, that's kind of where I fall on that and to let the, the, the staff kind of run the day-to-day -day operations, which would include making probably some very key decisions for the agency. Thank you, Ms. Thank Yes, Mr. Thompson. Uh, that's that is helpful feedback, and um, I, I agree a couple of things that Ms. Sierra said um, about the the staff really coming up, you know, getting input from the board, and then the staff developing a, a proposal or recommendation that they can give to the board. I'm I think one of the challenges that that we saw um, was we, uh, the two of us, Ms. De La Torre and myself, as a subcommittee, had some thinking and ideas that we would then share with the staff. Um, the staff couldn't, were limited in their ability to say, well, actually, this other subcommittee is doing something similar because they can't be a conduit between the subcommittees. So there, we ended up where there was, um, I don't know if this actually happened or 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 hypothetically could happen, but 
the part of the purpose in raising this was this is one of the limited venues and that we have to get together the five of us and kind of and talk about okay how do we what do we need to do as a board to your point Ms. Sierra versus what does the staff need to do and then how do we we organize it um there are some longer term issues that are not the immediate front burner you know and I think Mr. Soltani correctly prioritized the uh, bringing on resources for rulemaking bringing on resources to for administration and HR you know though that's that's the immediate triage of what we need to do. And then what are we doing longer term or medium to longer term are some of the things that, that were coming up as far as how do we operate as a board? How do we, what does this look like in a year from now? What does this look like in two years from now? Because the pace with which we're bringing resources on is, is not as fast as we would like. So some of the issues that we, we flagged were uh, I think appropriately things for the staff to follow up on, but we also want to out utilize our scarce staff resources effectively and and not, we didn't want as a subcommittee to be saying, oh, can you do this, this, and this, and then have another subcommittee saying, oh, can you do this, this, and this, and those two things are very closely related, because that might, yeah. and and maybe the, the answer to that is when those things occur, the staff will just prioritize uh, or modify the guidance or requests that they get from us to to accommodate um, the resourcing that they they have available. Um, my thought is, as we're having this conversation, is perhaps we need to organize ourselves to look at those medium to longer term questions now, as as a, a combined a, a board and and staff. A, a, if it's within the scope of a subcommittee, if it's the startup subcommittee morphing into a, I'm making this up, a, an organizational design and strategic subcommittee. Um, if that scope goes within an existing subcommittee, we don't have to answer that now, but I, I think we do need to look at those, look a little bit further down the road um, on, on how we're gonna organize ourselves. And I, those were, in some, in some instances, those were the nature of the questions we were teeing up. Some of them were, are the short-term triage questions. Right? Can we uh, can we bring in resources from UCs? And um, are, are there are there other public entities that we can draw upon um, to get chunks of people who can who can help us? Um, and again, you know, is that a is that a rules process issue? Is that a startup issue? Is it a third category? Should we just say okay, it resides here and then and move on? That was the feedback and guidance we were looking for. Is uh, um, if there's a view on okay, it resides here. Let's 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 make that decision and move on. Um, so that I think it's it's probably helpful to this Mr. Soltani and the and the staff if there is some board input and oversight as they move forward. Um, so to to give that where it was helpful and needed. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, Ms. Delatore. Thank you, Mrs. Servan. I. Um, agree with everything that has been say or said uh, so far. I just wanted to um, highlight that I think there is a consensus around the fact that we have to allow staff to direct traffic, particularly for this effort, but also moving forward. And it, there's also consensus around um, allowing staff to set priorities because they have more visibility on where we are in terms of resources, etc. I also wanted to highlight what Mr. Thompson mentioned before, which is we, we're looking at this um, short effort of rulemaking, but we also have to start thinking about how we strategically set ourselves up towards the future. And it sounded from the comments that I heard, but correct me if I'm wrong, that there might be support for the process of committee to start thinking about models of how we could organize ourselves. and. I just wanted to remind the, the members of, of the um, board that there is there is obviously different models, but there is also within CPRA, the, there is a possibility of asking for legislative changes if we find ourselves deciding that there is a model that we seek that might require some changes in the in the way. Um, you know, we allocate responsibilities within the board or in the way different members of the board are compensated. So we thought 
it will be helpful to just start thinking in those terms and you know organizing our thoughts so that they, then we can we can present to the board. Um, it sounds like there is support for that, and that piece might not interfere with the startup subcommittee because the startup subcommittee is more focused on the agency. But that we should at all points check with the staff in case we're you know wandering into an area where we might be creating some overlap. Is that is that a good summary of, of what I have heard so far? Uh, thank you, Ms. Delatory. Sounds like a, a good summary to me. Um, I've been listening carefully with my startup administration subcommittee hat on. Uh, and but actually, let me back up uh, and also uh, support the substantive suggestion of the process subcommittee working with staff to produce um, a report or something that um, uh, analyzes the different options for rulemaking process. I agree with Ms. Sierra that that would be extremely helpful, and that seems to be squarely within the bailiwick of the process subcommittee. Um, in terms of board structure, organizational structure, strategic uh, planning, that Ms. Mr. Thompson mentioned. My thinking is that to the extent those things are related directly to rulemaking, that's maybe one question. And to the extent they're more general, that's maybe another question. Um, and so without having talked with Ms. Sierra about this, um, so Ms. Sierra, please feel free to shoot me down if you need to. Um, I. I, I think that we could offer to work with the executive director and staff to organize a couple of things for the board. Um, one might be general information about organizational structure and uh, board role. Um, and, and I guess that, would, that could connect to strategic thinking. I, I do think that a lot of that in my view, is within the executive director's realm to then come and present to the board. Um, but it seems as though, to me, as that the startup administration subcommittee could certainly work with the executive director, with Mr. Souble, um, the way we are on figuring out policies um, to try to come up with um, and thinking for the board that, as Mr. Thompson put it, is beyond the immediate moment. Um, but to the extent that we're talking about how we accomplish this rulemaking, that seems to me that that is uh, properly within the process, the rulemaking process subcommittee. Yes, Ms. Sierra? Um, thank you. And as the other member of the Startup and Administration Committee, that what you are proposing um, is very good to me, you know, in working with um, the first part, um, working with the um, executive director and Duble on the kind of bigger organizational or strategic um, issue for the board as opposed to the rulemaking. Um, issues that you've identified for the process subcommittee. But yeah, I think that, you know, is, it would fit well within our subcommittee work with staff on supporting them and providing a report to the board to give us, you know, more information to make kind of some of the final decisions of what model we um, go with moving forward on the night of the higher level, bigger picture. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. And in terms of the immediate rulemaking, I do worry that we could step on the rulemaking process subcommittee's work and the information they're working with. Yeah. So to the extent, for example, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson, you were thinking of approaching experts at UC um, to work on the economic impact statement or something like that. Um, my initial reaction would be that it would be appropriate to work with the executive director on that out of your process subcommittee. Um, but I would like to offer that example as um, something for reaction um, by the subcommittee. So I can be 
so I can understand whether I'm un, uh, kind of understanding the moving parts uh, as you intend. Yes, Mr. Lay. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> just on the overall, you know, vision and thoughts about structure, I think uh, Chris mentioned some board input on that. Um, you know, I think I've heard some some folks say, uh, you know, working with staff, um, just overall for me, I, I imagine I like the bottom up um, where, you know, the board can set the overall direction and tone and then um, staff can let things bubble up to us and uh, let us understand and bring up topics that, you know, they want our input on um, after we've set this overall structure and guide. So, yeah, those are just my thoughts on the overall structure and long-term vision for, for the board. Um, Thank you, Mr. Lay. I agree with that. Um, Ms. De La Torre? Thank you. I just wanted to clarify um, that, um, and, and Mr. Mr. Thompson can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, the process of committee has always understood its role to go beyond this particular rulemaking process into just how we do rulemaking and moving forward. So I just think that we, this might be something to not resolve today, but just start thinking about, because if if that's part of what's within the process of committee, I'm not sure how we set the division between that and the strategic vision of how we operate as a board excluding that piece and subdivide it into subcommittees. So it might be that we just need to think about this in terms of involving the staff more, but if that's the case, we probably need to deprioritize it because the staff right now has you know, many other um, burning priorities that they have to deal with. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that, that I believe uh, Mr. Thompson and I know myself, we have always thought of the, about the process of committee, not only thinking about this rulemaking effort, but just in general, you know, moving forward, how do we do rulemaking in a way that's that that's most efficient? I agree with that. Um, that it's I'm, I'm thinking about it as the, the sets of rules that we have before us in the in the relatively immediate term, but also a, a broader process broader process of how we how we promulgate rules. Um, and I, I think there's general consensus among the board that the ideal state is that the staff operate the agency and and, and the board provide guidance and direction. Um, when I was thinking about the medium and, and longer term, you know, I'm thinking about you know how do we right now the the board outnumbers the staff. Um, so you know we, we, those those lines need to cross where this staff outnumbers the board. Um, and I, I, I totally agree that that is the ideal state, um, but I think we need to think about how do we get there in the, what's, what, what are the interim steps before we get to the ideal state? Um, and what is most helpful to our end goals and what is most helpful to us empowering and, and giving the staff the resources and the empowerment to, to go do the things that we're asking them to do. Um, but, you know, I think those lines will cross, I, hopefully, in the, in the relatively near future where they outnumber us. Um, so, I, I think, I, from my perspective, I think we, this has been a good discussion and we've got the guidance we need for the relative, for, for our next set of meetings. Um, and perhaps we can revisit this topic if there's any additional thoughts in the future. And I, I what I heard loud and clear was an agreement that, an analysis of our options and what the relative merits of them are um, is something we should prioritize and, and deliver as soon as we can, because that's going to inform the work of the other subcommittees uh, and our, our work going forward. And, and so I, I think that is probably our highest priority task as a subcommittee going forward. And you know, we just all need to keep open minds about the options that, that we've seen thus far, and they are complicated and interact with each other. Um, in ways that that uh, a, looking at the whole picture would be helpful, and so that's what we will endeavor to deliver to you all. Ms. Delatore, um, I don't know if there are more comments, but we might want to go back to the slides at this point if everybody is okay with that. And the slides, um, it clearly that. Go ahead. Ms. Sorry, can I just just to be 
for, for the record. And so we are all clear. When we are talking about an analysis of options, we are talking about uh, with regards to our process for this rulemaking, um, drawing from what Mr. Soublé presented, and maybe other things will appear, but that's the basic set. I just wanted to be sure that um, we were all on the same page about that. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I also wanted to clarify, uh, so um, makes sense to me, process subcommittees thinking about rulemaking generally. Of course, the interaction of the board with the staff and the way the agency develops an organization and all of that is not just rulemaking. It, it crosses all of the different areas of the, um, of the agency's remit. So uh, is, is there energy for the Startup Administration Subcommittee to help the executive director think about this at a high level? Or um, is there more energy around leaving it with the executive director, putting it aside? I just I sort of lost track um, in the conversation on that broader point. And I just wanted to be sure I had a sense of it before we moved on, if that's all right. Yes, Ms. De La Torre. Right. Um, so the, um, from our perspective, we never really thought about this conversation as a conversation where we will allocate work to the startup subcommittee, first of all, because we think you're really busy with other priorities, but also because so long as this um, process of committee is functioning, I think it's going to be very difficult for a different subcommittee to take on that task without creating some form of overlap. So my um, reading based on this conversation is that the process of committee should continue the work on the rulemaking piece, and then maybe we can table the other conversation. I think it's great if um, the executive director could look into models, but I just don't I just don't think it's a priority for the staff right now. And I think it will be very difficult for another subcommittee to get involved without creating overlap. Uh, so it seems to me that it might be just best to just keep thinking individually, um, and maybe during the meetings of other subcommittees about how we integrate. Um, the reality is that we have created subcommittees based on the immediate needs that we had, which was appropriate at the time. But we at some point are going to have to start thinking about how we, you know, how we go into phase two and phase three, where we have more a more stable um, structure of subcommittees and, and meetings and all of that. Thank so you. to summarize, Mr. Sullivan, <laughs> don't start anything on the startup subcommittee, and the process subcommittee will stay on the rulemaking track for this rulemaking effort and potentially looking at how we can, you know, have a better process for rulemaking in the future. And then we all can think about how we coordinate work to envision the future structure of the board. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. I needed to understand if Ms. Sierra and I had homework. <laughs> so yeah. I think, I think, uh, I think, I think that we, I think that we understand. Um, thank you. All right, um, so uh, shall we move to the, the third phase of your of your work? Rulemaking process subcommittee, great, thank you. I'll turn it back. I wanted to give an opportunity, if there are any comments on this piece of recommendations to just talk about them beyond um, the conversation we had. Is there anything else that you wanna discuss? Seems like we're ready. Um, let's go to slide number 10. And what we have done within the process of committee is basically look at all of the items that were left within the process of committee for allocation. Uh, we came to the conclusion that the most efficient way to go about it will be to immediately allocated to the subcommittees that are working on the substance of the rulemaking. And this is an allocation that is not, um, we're not allocating these topics for rulemaking, we're allocating them for consideration as to whether rulemaking is necessary or not. So each subcommittee will have the ability to look into all of these items and decide whether this is something that should be prioritized in this rulemaking activity or perhaps not. There's one exception to that rule that we will talk about in the slide. 11, 
but all of the other topics are just left open for um, determination by the subcommittees that are working on substance. And to um, point that Mrs. Irvin was making on uh, homework, <laughs> so I'm uh, kind of uh, regretfully have to for the CCPA subcommittee that <laughs> there's a lot of homework that has been allocated to that subcommittee, and it is by design, right? Like we wanted to create a subcommittee that dealt with with the core of the CCPA update, and then a separate subcommittee that is dealing with the things that are new, um, which has a, another set of challenges because we don't have, you know, we, we don't have a test of rules to kind of work from. We have to start from scratch. So um, the reason I'm saying that is because the most efficient way for me to present this idea is to talk about what has been allocated to the CPRA rules subcommittee, because basically everything else has been allocated to the the CPPA rules update subcommittee. So in terms of the CPRA rules subcommittee, the same issues that were allocated in the past during the September board meeting will remain in that subcommittee. If needed, um, the subcommittee will consider uh, to propose a definition for law enforcement agency approved investigation. This is one of the items that is especially specifically called out in the CPRA as an item for potential rulemaking. And uh, the third bullet point is, again, if needed, issue rules regarding enforcement process and, if needed, work with the legislature to harmonize those requirements. The reason why this is allocated to the CPRA rules subcommittee is because the CPRA rules subcommittee is already looking into auditing authority, and there's some overlap here, so it seemed to make sense to allocate it to the CPRA rules subcommittee. Uh, it's also something that is absolutely new. And the last um, bullet point is, if needed, issue rules on record keeping requirements, but only in regards to cybersecurity audits, risk assessments, and automated decision making. And to um, give a little bit of context on this recommendation, in our prior meeting, the CPPA rules subcommittee brought up the idea of the need to issue rules regarding um, record keeping re requirements. And that is um, something that makes a lot of sense and has been allocated to the CPPA rules update subcommittee. But this need of a uh, rule around record keeping requirements should not be allocated in our view to only one subcommittee because both subcommittees will have the need to look into what record keeping requirements are needed for the substance of the rules that they are um, issuing. Uh, so th those are the things allocated to the CPRA rules subcommittee. When you look at the allocations, and they are in the additional materials for the CPPA updates, uh, update as a committee, again, uh, we keep what was there there, what was allocated in the September meeting. Uh, in addition, uh, the definition of business purpose, which was allocated already in our prior meeting, and then if needed, issue rules in regarding uh, additional topics, and that is where I, you know, we wrote as per supplemental materials because there is a long list in the supplemental materials. I understand from the comments of Mrs. Irvin uh, previously that the CPPA rules the committee has had the opportunity to look at those materials, and um, we're open to any comments that you might have on those. And the last um, bullet point is again kind of a mirror image of the last bullet point for the CPRA rules. Updates the committee is just regarding the need for record keeping requirements with regards to all of these substantive items that the CPPA rules updates the committee um, has under its uh, purview. Um, the last um, column there, the rulemaking process committee, keep, will keep the coordination uh, for the generation of uh, a report in regards to the insurance industry and whether it is proper for um, the CPRA to apply to the insurance industry will be a determination that will be made, made by the board based on that report. Uh, supervised coordinated rulemaking effort until the staff can take over and provide recommendations as to how to best organize for future rulemaking efforts. This goes to what Mr. Thompson and myself were bringing up um, in the conversation we just had that we always envision our room, our subcommittee as thinking not only 
about this rulemaking effort, but also about future rulemaking efforts. And then consider make recommendations and any need for additional rules. Um, with that, I just wanted to um, go to slide 11 for a second before we take the comments from the board. This is the only topic where we're clearly um, advising against including it in the current rulemaking activities. Um, this is the biannual adjustments to monetary thresholds. Based on our reading of that uh, requirement, that those adjustments should be made in 2025. So we don't, we shouldn't have to think about them right now. Uh, so we are um, recommending that that particular topic not be um, something that we have to um, think about in either subcommittee. And um, basically that's, that's it. Uh, we would like to make this into an action item that we vote on to uh, make sure that we allocate the topics. But before we do that, I wanna open it for comments uh, by the uh, other board members as to whether they um, have any feedback on, on what we're proposing. Thank you very much, Ms. De La Torre. Comments, feedback from, from board members? Yes, Ms. Tierra. Hi, um, thank you, Chair Urban. And I just wanna just to clarify, so the action item would be the previous slide, the, the allocation um, as Dylan needs the previous slide. Right. The action item will be to have a motion to allocate the topics as described in the slides, unless there's some feedback or comments where we have to, you know, change the allocations and then we can reformulate that action item accordingly. Right. Yes. And so, yeah, they those seem very appropriate to me. And I think, I guess, what's built into this is then moving forward, staff will be then directing if there's other topics. Um, for a various subcommittee, um, for example, the update subcommittee, then the staff will be directing that. Does that um, I want to make sure that th that is kind of the thinking after this vote? Right. That will be our understanding that after mm -hmm. this vote, any um, subcommittee that might see the need of, um, you know, issuing rules. I mean, um, Chairman Urban gave two really good examples before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they just have a conversation with the staff unless the staff flags um, something as um, a topic that has to be um, part of a co board conversation, just move along uh, in in your efforts um, with the feedback from staff. Great, thank you. Well, I my, I'm looking at um, the division of um, topics that you have provided that those all seem very appropriate to me. So unless, you know, we have other comments or questions, I, but for the action item, I can make a motion. I'm, I'm happy. Thank you, Ms. Yeah, we actually need to do public comment. Wow. Well, um, thank before. you. Uh, Sorry and uh, I have um, taken the liberty of formulating some draft action items for this, um, uh, which we, but we should take up public comment first. Um, based on the slides that were made available for public consumption, um, I checked, and I think that we actually need to have three action items, one to allocate, one to, allocate to each subcommittee. Um, but that's just a matter of process. Uh, I would also like to uh, register my support for this plan and to thank the rulemaking process subcommittee for its careful thought um, on the appropriate way to allocate the topics that the regulations subcommittee had listed. And I also very much support um from this point forward working with staff to understand what each subcommittee should do with items that that haven't been officially allocated or that um require looking at some other existing regulation we didn't think to mention um uh how to so how to approach those so i i really commend and appreciate the rulemaking process of committee's work and i support um these recommendations are there any other comments or questions from the board? All right, thank you. Are there any comments from the public? Okay. 
Just giving them a few minutes to react. Of course, thank you, Ms. Hurtado. And actually, I realized I, um, I had better double check with Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson um, to find out if you presented what you would like to present at this point or if I jumped in for public comment too early. Okay, great, thank you. There are no public comments at this time. Thank you, Mr. Tato. Uh, well, uh, given that, um, I propose um, three action items which allocate the topics to the different subcommittees. Um, and two, I can, I can uh, say them all or I can do them one at a time. Um, I'll start with the one for the new CPRA rules subcommittee, uh, so everyone has a flavor. Um, which is a motion um, to assign the following topics to the new uh, Ca uh, California Privacy Rights Act Rules Subcommittee for further work if and as needed, the definition of law enforcement agency approved investigation, the enforcement process, and the subset of record keeping requirements that apply to cybersecurity audits, risk assessments, and automated decision making. Um, did I leave anything out? Does that? Um, I, I'm not looking at the slides, but maybe we should add as, as, as identifying the slides and, and that's yeah, that. Let me add that. Um, uh, all right, so may I have a motion to assign the following topics to the new CPRA rules subcommittee for further work if and as needed. Um, the definition of law enforcement agency approved investigation, the enforcement process, and the subset of record keeping requirements that apply to cybersecurity audits, risk assessments, and automated decision making, uh, and any other topics as reflected in the slides the process subcommittee presented in the board's November 15th meeting. I move. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Do I have a second? A second. Thank you, Ms. Sierra, I have a motion and a second um, for the action on the table. Ms. Hurtado, would you please perform the roll call vote? Ms. Dilatori? Aye. Mr. Lay? Aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Mr. Thompson? Mr. Thompson? We're voting. You, you're muted. Oops, we just lost Mr. Thompson. Shall we wait for him to come back? Uh, yes, let's go ahead and wait for him to come back. Okay. I will also vote aye. Okay, thank you. I think he just pressed the, there, the exit button is right above the, the uh, microphone button. So it would have been just a, Okay, I see that he's still in the in the queue, so it could be a blue jeans. Um, oh, there he goes. Okay. Um, Ms. Hurtado, would it's um, 
make sense for us to take a short break and that might be a good idea just to let him um, come back on in case he needs some assistance. I can help him while we're on break. Okay. Um, and Mr. Bruder, there's no issue with taking a short break while we're in the middle of an agenda item. Is there or is there? Uh, no, there's no issue. Okay. 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 All right. In